I'm going to try to break this into two sections, one where we go over uh, this new technique at a high level and then one where we get into some code. And um, there was also a request for more worked examples um, in the feedback last night. So uh, in the code, I'm going to combine some of the API work we did yesterday with this new technique. So we're going to visualize some Twitter network from Congress, uh, from elected officials in the US. Um, so, uh, OK. So um, we're going to have to kind of take a little bit of a detour here into some basics of, of, of social network analysis um, in order to, um, to, to go over this technique. Can I see a show of hands? How many people have had the basics of social network analysis? Oh, almost everybody. All right. I saw at least six people that weren't raising their hand. And my guess is, who's, he who's heard of a bipartite affiliation network? Okay, a fair, but about half of all people. Who knows what between us centrality is? Okay, I think we need to review, because like different people are raising their hands for different things. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster than playing about two things. Okay, so uh, what is a social network? This is a social network. It is a, is a set of uh, nodes and edges. Um, a node, um, typically speaking, is, is an individual. Um, sometimes an organization, but really any kind of unit of analysis broadly conceived. Um, you know, if you're familiar with graph theory, we might be thinking about uh, computers or internet sites. But typically speaking, in social science, um, when we think about a node, we think about a person. And when we think about um, an edge, uh, we think about a relationship between people. Um, Relationships can come in all shapes and sizes. We can have friendships, we can be colleagues, we can be coworkers, we can be family members. Um, so uh, edges are multiplex. That means they have multiple dimensions. Um, edges can also be directed or undirected. And that refers to whether or not your graph has essentially an arrow um, or if it's just a line. A directed tie usually describes someone who's, for example, uh, in a group of friends, someone who nominates someone else as a friend. Um, so in the case of person 20 and person 18 here, person 20 is saying that person 18 is their friend, but person 18 isn't saying that person 20 is their friend. Um, that's the core distinction between directed and undirected networks. And um, this has... Um, some implications for how we transform, how we go from network visualizations into adjacency matrices. So we're seeing here two adjacency matrices. One is for an undirected network, and one is for a directed network. Um, so the way this works, here in both, actually in both cases, we have five individuals, A, B, C, D, E. And you see that um, in the undirected network, anytime there's a tie between any two nodes. So here, between A and B, we see a 1 because there's an edge here. Um, we see a 0 between A and E because there's no tie there, and so on and so forth. And we can go through the graph, and this essentially is a matrix representation of, of our network visualization over here. And in the case of our directed network, we see it's slightly different. We only see ones where the focal node, in this case A, is nominating the alter. Um, B, um, in this case, A is nominating B uh, as a friend, and A is nominating D as a friend. Um, and um, I should say, by the way, network ter terminology, particularly across the many diverse fields assembled here, can vary a lot. So sometimes you'll hear nodes referred to as a vertex or vertices. Sometimes you'll hear edges referred to as ties. Um, and um, sometimes you'll hear a network referred to as a graph. So if these are your your words. Um, that's just a few um, few orienting uh, jargon uh, clarifications. Um, any questions about how we go from here to here, or just basics of, of, of what this stuff means, especially if it's your first time seeing uh, social network or network? Okay. So um, basically. Uh, often it's the case that we want to identify um, some measure of influence in a social network. We might want to know, um, 
for example, who's the most popular person in a friendship network. Um, and um, there are a variety of um, uh, measures we might use to calculate that type of influence. Um, here's four. The first one we're seeing on the left here is called in degree. And in degree, if we're talking about Twitter, uh, in degree describes the person who has the most followers. If you have the highest in degree, then you are the person with the most followers. Um, if you have the highest out degree on Twitter, then you are the person who follows the most people on Twitter. I found that person once. Uh, completely unremarkable. Um, between this, um, this is essentially, um, in layman's terms, the, the person who is between the largest clusters of people. And that's assuming that um, influence there is about brokerage or being able to span multiple groups of people. And then finally, closeness centrality typically refers to the person who's in the middle of the largest cluster. And there are many, many other extensions of centrality measures. For example, eigenvector centrality, where uh, influence is measured by kind of second order influence. So are you connected to the person who's the most influential? So here, this graph here just kind of shows how these different types of measures will generate different types of, of um, influence. So if we're talking about between us centrality, this node H here, or this person H, um, is the uh, most influential because a juicy rumor about a new job in computational social science that starts in this cluster um, has to pass through her to get through this other, this other group of um, young aspiring computational social scientists. On the other hand, closeness centrality here uh, refers to the most central position within a cluster within a network, and clusters can be identified in a variety of ways. And the math is pretty simple and intuitive. We typically combine a measure of path length to start estimating um, the number of steps it takes to go in the market. So when Michael Macy was talking about range, he was counting the number of hops one has to get travel from one node to get to, in the case of several of these measures, all other nodes in the network. Um, and we can get, and, and there's an entire literature that spans sociology and um, physics and computer science and all sorts of other interesting fields that's produced uh, dozens and dozens of, of different centrality methods. Um, we can also um, take advantage of some nice properties of graph theory uh, to do something called community detection. So um, we can use something as straightforward as a cluster analysis. Um, uh, we can use something as complicated as the Levain method. Um, and everything in between. Um, you know, by my last count, there's approximately, you know, 40 plus popular uh, algorithms for community detection, but they all share a, a similar goal, which is to group um, nodes within a network into some type of meaningful group, typically based upon the um, patterns of associations. So these groups are, this, uh, this particular Louvain algorithm that was used to make this uh, um, um, mod, what's called a modularity class, which means the modularity is simply kind of another word for cluster here. Um, you'll see we've got um, a, a lot of mutual ties within this cluster and, and few outgroup ties. Um, this is a fairly disconnected graph, meaning that um, you know there's a lot of separation between these clusters, and so the community detection here is a pretty straightforward um, task. Um, but just big picture, um, there's, a variety, there's, a, there's a variety of ways of, of finding groups and social networks. Um, we can also take advantage of the fact that often we know attributes of these nodes, and those help us further classify things. So it's almost like an analog to, to metadata and top modeling in some sense. Um, importantly, often we, all, we have data that has weighted ties. So we might not only care about different types of ties, family ties versus friend ties, co-worker ties versus friend ties, but relationships also have different amounts of strength. Um, so here in this graph, we see these five people, um, these numbers on each of the edges here, the curved edges, describe um, the uh, strength of their relationship. Um, and this is, the, this is the type of measure that Macy was talking about on Monday night. Um, and this is also kind of the classic intuition behind the um, Strength of Weak Ties article that was on our assigned reading list uh, by Mark Granovic. Um, 
one, one thing to note with a weighted graph is that we can, um, our, 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 adjacency matrix, our adjacency matrix is no longer a set of zeros and ones. Instead of zeros and ones, we have the strength of the tie in the adjacency matrix. Um, so uh, let, me, let me just say that this, the, the tech, uh, networks that are weighted have the additional nice property that that can improve our community detection. So we, if we know that, you know, for example, all of these ties are really strong, that helps our algorithm group, uh, group people into these different modularity classes. Any questions so far? So um, what I think is a really interesting idea and, and, a, and an, an interesting alternative to many of the other available automated text analysis techniques is to instead of think of nodes as the focal point, uh, sorry, people as the focal point of a network, um, to think about words, phrases, or ideas as focal points um, that can link people to each other. So the concept of an n-gram network, which is the technique I'm going to talk about today, um, can either be used to treat words as nodes in a network or to connect people together based upon their shared use of certain words. And um, you can imagine connecting social media users, but you could also treat the focal node as a document in a corpus. So you could say <coughs> these two documents are very similar within a corpus. So um, you know the, the focal, the, the 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 application will depend on your unit of analysis. And I'll show you one example of uh, a paper that applies um, uh, uh, that makes words the focal unit of analysis, and another that makes people using words uh, the focal point. Of, of the analysis. So here we're going to first work through um, the more um, the 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 possibly more useful application, which is to think about connecting people based upon their shared use of words. Um, to do that, we have to capture some intuition um, from a classic paper written by Ronald Bragger, the sociologist, in 1974. Um, about the duality of persons and groups. So we typically think about a social network as connecting a set of individuals uh, to each other, um, but we can also do what's known as a two-mode projection of a social network. And that essentially means connecting people based upon their shared participation in another social group. So uh, Breiger had this very uh, you know, parsimonious a simple observation, but um, uh, remarkably profound, that if you know, uh, if you have a matrix of group affiliations, if you know, uh, the, the example I like is um, uh, uh, from my colleague uh, Kieran Healy, who wrote a, a wonderful satirical piece on, on, on Slate and Slate magazine um, and during the Edward Snowden affair or you may remember uh, metadata was the key thing everybody was talking about, right? Um, the government's defense of, of the uh, PRISM uh, program was essentially that, um, you know, we're not viewing your individual data, we're viewing your metadata. And so the thought experiment that Kieran does in this wonderful piece is to say, what if the British government only had metadata? Could it have found Paul Revere before he did his kind of famous ride to uh, to start to, uh, to to tell everyone the British are coming, and lo and behold, he shows through some some old data uh, pr produced by historians that if you look at the matrix of people who belong to different revolutionary organizations, you can not only uh, um, flip that on its side, uh, this two mode projection, and see uh, the the entire network of who's related to who again based on so if Sam Adams and Paul Revere, I'm really testing my American history here, are in the same organization, um, then we give them a tie, right? So we can see, we can see that who might, is, who might be tied to each other, but then when we make that projection, you can actually see that Paul Revere is at the very center of that network. And so if I'm the British government, I know I have to go find Paul Revere because he's the most influential person in, in, in this scene, right? And so the intuition here is to take that, that very brilliant idea and instead of thinking about linking people to groups, link people to something like a word, a phrase, or an n-gram, which I'll explain in just a second. I think probably many people are familiar with an n-gram, essentially some chunk of text. 
Um, so how do we do this? Uh, this is just what I just said. Not quite. Instead, so okay. So instead of treating people as nodes, let's treat people shared use of words as edges in a network, um, and connect them not by uh, friendship but by their shared use of a term. And the nice thing here is that we can combine NLP methods with network methods to specify how strong these ties are. So the approach I'll show you today uses the term frequency inverse document frequency, which is used in many of the topping models that Brandon just described, um, to uh, essentially uh, uh, give more weight to rare words um, that are used infrequently across a set of documents, or in this case, across a set of people. We can then group people, and again, remember, you can do this both with people or documents, um, using the, the various centrality or community detection techniques that I just described. And those have some nice properties um, that I think uh, are more conducive to testing a lot of the social science themes that we care about in text. So um, let's, we're going to walk through uh, two examples, um, and both are going to use n-grams. Uh, so an n-gram is simply a chunk of text um, that has a length n. So in this first sentence, we have four unigrams. This is one, this is one, a is one, and sentence is one. In the second one, we have uh, this is, that's one bigram, is a is one bigram, and a sentence is one bigram, and so on and so forth. We can go all the way up to, uh, to n. Um, and the nice thing about this is we can capture um, phrases in context. Um, and so what's nice about this approach, though really about any approach, I mean, the <coughs> earlier question I think it was uh, Kevin that asked was, uh, what, who asked it, uh, was, uh, you know, is it better sometimes to chunk up text in different ways? Um, and there we were talking about, I think we were talking about paragraphs and documents, but um, we can go all the way down to the level of the sentence and sub-sentence level, and that has some nice properties as well. So um, let's, let's look at how, this is, this is from a paper I wrote um, that's linked in the last slide of this uh, talk. Um, I was out to try to, um, and you may want to open it up on your, on your machine just to follow along because some of this text is, is painfully small. Um, this is a study where I was trying to determine how the relationship between different messages about autism spectrum disorders um, is related to the, the viral diffusion of messages um, within that field on Facebook. And so basically, um, I was testing a theory that I have about uh, what I call cultural between us. So the idea was essentially that um, people become influential not only by occupying brokerage positions within a social network, but with, within, by brokering um, different positions within a system of ideas. So um, I can say more about that if people are interested. It's not quite um, necessary to understand the technique, but it's, it's, a, it's a possible example. So uh, it's a possible application. So in this case, the steps to create the n-gram network were as, were as followed. First, um, first, I took a corpus of Facebook posts um, using um, several of the um, API techniques we uh, discussed yesterday morning. Here's an example of three of them. The first one is, autistic people don't want your cure. Neurodiversity is a fact. The second one is, here are the facts. There is no cure for autism, and vaccines do not cause autism. And finally, vaccines made our children autistic, not us. And if, you're, if you know this field, these are kind of three. One, one describes the principle of neurodiversity, or the idea that autism spectrum disorders result from some kind of underlying neurological variation in some, instead of some type of pathogen. Um, the other is this, um, this uh, 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 persistent rumor that um, timerosol in um, MMR vaccines causes autism spectrum disorders. So the next step is then essentially just to figure out which parts of those texts carry meaning in your field. Um, and, and which type of, what, what you want to capture. This is a stage where you could choose essentially any kind of text you want. Again, you could tokenize in many ways. You could use bigrams, unigrams, um, hypothetically entire documents. Um, <coughs> or you can choose different parts of speech. 
I made the bet here building on some work uh, by um, some sociologists um, at uh, Columbia and a physicist, physicist at Columbia who I'll describe in just a second to look at nouns and noun phrases, um, betting that that's where much of the important meaning comes from in um, discussions about substantive topics. That you could you could make um, other you can make a case for many other parts of speech like adjectives, particularly if you cared about the valence of a text. So this won't tell you whether people think vaccines are good or bad. It just tells you that they're thinking about vaccines. Um, and that was because my research agenda was much more related to the literature on framing than the literature on on, on sentiment and valence. That's another story. So we can then essentially using part of speech tagging and lemmatization, which is a variant of stemming that I described earlier, um, we can then take each post and break out the nouns and noun phrases. So here we have autism, neurodiversity, fact, cure, vaccines, autism, fact, cure, and so on and so forth. And once we have the terms and all the actors, in this case, these are organizations that are producing these texts, um, we can then calculate the term frequency, inverse document frequency. Um, and so each each, um, each of these words, and remember we're working with a huge corpus in this case, is going to get a different um, uh, weight, essentially, that describes how rare it is compared to the, uh, its usage across the entire corpus. And we use the overlap in words. We take the sum of the TF-IDF to construct the weight of a tie between two actors or, or, um, or documents if you're if you're applying this to documents instead of people. But we're doing the two-mode projection here. So here we see that these two organizations have a very strong tie with each other um, because they're both using multiple strange words. These two organizations, one and three, have a much weaker tie because they only share one word with each other, and that's autism. And in this um, particular um, online discussion, that word doesn't carry much meaning because everybody's using it, more or less. Does that make sense? Yeah, you th yeah. Just conceptually, I'm just trying to wrap my head around what a, what, like what a what a what a tie means here. Mm -hmm. Is it just means that like, like can we just think of that as like, that, the, that the language that each group uses is is similar or you know or correlated or the, the, the ties are actually you're actually saying that there is some underlying relationship that the linguistic similarity is picking up on? I think it's both that they're using similar language in general and also that they're using similar language that's unusual. So the the if they if they choose word if so if they use similar language they have a lot they have some tie um, and then if they use if they use uh, similar unusual language um, they'll get a stronger tie right but if they use similar language that is the tie though right like they're tied by the similar language that they use well the tie has a weight so the tie so the tie could be you know very weak if they only use this you know um, I'll I've, I've dropped words here like and and the and but but you can imagine that if everybody's using the word the, and then everybody's going to have a tie to each other. Um, you, so in that case, but would be creating a tie. Um, but in this case, it's only noun phrases, and um, the, uh, the overlap in noun phrases, if there's any overlap in noun phrases, they'll get um, some type of tie. If there's overlap in noun phrases that are used infrequently in the corpus, they'll have a stronger tie. So it's a combination of both um, overlap and rare overlap. Yeah, for sure. No, I might have missed this, but when constructing and measuring the tie, is this like analogous to like a cosine distance between? That would be another interesting way to go. Um, if it would be another way to develop a tie, um, I like the property of the um, uh, TF-IDF because otherwise, really common words create um, really dense connections between people. Um, but um, yeah, there's any number of, of really interesting, you know, any distance metrics really could be used hypothetically to create top. So be an interesting extension. Yeah, Anto. So you mentioned earlier that there's sort of like the the framing part and the sentiment part. Mm -hmm. You only looked at kind of what words they use as a right. the valence of them. Have you seen examples of n-gram networks that are able to kind of overlay them effect in an effective way to understand both like how people talk, how different organizations, for example, talk about things, but then also like polarization within the way. No, and that would be a great extension. And I think the way to do it would be to give the ties a polarity. So, um, you know, ties could be positive or negative based on the sentiment of the text. So that's one extension that I've been thinking about um, of the method. 
good question. Or a good idea. Other questions? Good. Yeah. Speaker, all the ties are symmetrical? Or the uh, you mean, are they always symmetrical? Yeah. Oh, oh you mean, are they directed? Yeah. Uh, these are undirected. Yeah. Okay. You could, you could imagine having um, a directed network if, if, for example, you had a multivocal context where people are talking at each other, or, um, and you had one person directing a comment, and that's often the case on like a web log. You can search yeah. yeah, that's another interesting extension. Yeah. One that hasn't been built yet. Um, so, you know, once you do this, you can start um, you can start seeing really, I think, interesting patterns and in data. So here's all the uh, all the organizations I'm studying in this paper, uh, a couple hundred here, and the uh, the, the this is a, just a, a heat map that describes the um, strength of their tie to each other. I would have showed you the network projection, but it's it's too dense. And actually, one of the challenges of this method is to is um, specifying a cut point for the weights. So uh, depending on, I'll show you when I get to a worked example, um, that um, there's, there's, there's more or less sophisticated ways of doing that. Um, there, it, it's kind of analogous to the validation issue in, in um, topic modeling. Um, but um, because the community detection um, literature is pretty sophisticated, there's some nice techniques for choosing optimal, what's called optimal modularity. And I'll hopefully get to talk about that a little bit. Um, we can also project, the, the other neat thing is we can do this over time. So here we have a 3D adjacency matrix that, um, where time is on our uh, z-axis. And here we can start to see um, these relationships and cultural relationships, if you will, um, evolving over time. In the context of this paper, I talk about cultural holes in meaning structures opening and closing and how those create opportunities for, in this case, for organizations to broker multiple topics or, or themes in a text, I shouldn't use topics, um, to, to, um, to increase the appeal of their message, um, to increase the, what, what I call the resonance of their message. <coughs> There's uh, another really, uh, really, really nice application. It's also in PNAS. Uh, it's also linked at the end of the, um, of the slides here. This is by uh, Jeff's colleague, Alex uh, Rule, and uh, Jean-Philippe uh, Ponte. Yeah, and Peter Bierman, who's like one of the early movers in, in network analysis. And if I had enough time here, I would have talked about his really fascinating early work on narrative network analysis, where as early as 1998, he and colleagues were thinking about um, using network analysis to describe narratives and treating nodes in a network as events in oral histories. Really just cool, very ahead of its time stuff. Um, but this is in some way a manifestation of Peter's early interest in that. Also, Jim Moody, my colleague at Duke's interest in this. And here, um, what these folks have done is they're not using people as the, uh, as the nodes here. In this case, they're using um, uh, nouns and noun phrases as the nodes. And so what they do is they look at, they use the State of the Union uh, corpus, which is just the State of the Union addresses over, what, 200 years or something like that, I think. And um, they use, here you're seeing um, how community detection measures, um, and this, this is, I believe, the Louvain method, L-O-U-V-A-I-N, um, is used to break out different topics in these speeches or themes um, according to color. So if you're looking on your machine, you'll be seeing political economy, production, domestic policy, foreign policy, statecraft, and immigration. Um, and it's a, it's a really interesting, I think, uh, it's, it's also, I would argue, a tool for reading, not unlike uh, topic modeling, but an interesting way of, of projecting um, text as networks. And then again, just like I showed you, my 3D adjacency matrix, we can also see um, topics evolving over time. So here we're seeing how different presidents um, have, have emphasized different topics over time using this kind of Sankey uh, diagram. Um, so, uh, questions so far about how this works? Or, okay. So, the advantages, I think, the first is uh, our, uh, the first is that I think it recognizes the relational nature of meaning, um, and also importantly, I think like the focal, the, the the unit of analysis here could be any type of symbol. Um, it could be a, a picture. It could be pieces of art. It could be um, 
any, any type of language, really. Um, and there's a, a pretty sophisticated tradition in both that cuts across um, linguistics, anthropology, and sociology um, that emphasizes the relational nature of meaning. That is the, the tendency for people to construct meaning by associating different symbols together. And um, this is one thing that I think this topic picks up nicely in a way that uh, a more um, abstract uh, bag of words approach um, does not. Second, I think it's less sensitive to word length restrictions that restrict topic models. So you still have the problem of, um, you know, if you have uh, very little text, um, it's hard to, um, to uh, specify, um, you know, the, the, the underlying, say, uh, interests of an actor or how they talk. Um, but at least you can see that um, in, the, in the projection, especially if you um, uh, add some attribute to the nodes, like the frequency of um, commenting or posting or, 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 um, make, uh, or newspaper articles or, or whatever you're, you're looking at. Um, it's possibly better equipped to handle shifts over time. I think, that I, 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 on the one hand, I think this is a huge um, benefit of, of structural topic modeling. Just Even just treating time as a, as a uh, piece of metadata is, is so vital uh, because you know, if we're talking about something like um, terror, right? you're doing some kind of analysis of media data over the last 50 years. I mean, you know, if you're training your model without recognizing shifts in over time the way that terror is used, you're going to be collapsing a lot of strange topics together and maybe um, maybe missing a lot of the nuance that's 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 you know important to your story. Um, I mentioned earlier, arguably there's some better validation methods available because of um, the the long. Um, tradition of, of, of uh, community detection and social network analysis like optimal modularity. Though Brandon didn't mention, and I really encourage you to check out, the, someone asked about validating uh, topics. Um, Brandon has developed, a, uh, I think, two new, two new uh, validation metrics um, in your package, right? Um, it's, uh, remind me that I... Oh, semantic coherence and semantic. exclusivity. Semantic coherence and exclusivity, but you also do what log likelihood and uh, yeah. and, and the Hannah uh, Wallet one. We look that? at dispersion of residuals, which is a model fit right. thing. And, right. Yeah, there's a few different things. Yeah, which I should say, not really invented as much as appropriated <laughs> from various yeah, yeah. places. Right. Well, yeah. okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, but you know, and I think if you talk to the authors of a lot of those methods, they're they're you know they'll, they'll be the first to admit that again, as Brendan said, anybody who's telling you that that. that uh, you know, um, a computer can read all your text for you and make sense of it. It's, it's just flat out lying. I mean, these things should be used, I think, in combination and iteratively to make sense of the corpus. Um, finally, I think one nice uh, one nice advantage of this approach is that I think it's it's a little more parsimonious and transparent. So I think I think there's there's some value in the simplicity of the approach. Um, you know, you don't need to do two mode projections. You don't need to do um, weighted networks, you could just do a simple text network with community detection, and if you prune, especially if you drop common words, you can still pick up, uh, I think, some really interesting patterns in text. Um, because it's my technique, uh, there are no disadvantages. Um, <laughs> but um, there, are, there are many disadvantages that I'll, t I'll talk. We're going to work through some code in a second, I'll, and I'll show you some, some um, a variety of problems, including this this issue of how you prune, what what cut point you use to establish what a meaningful tie is. Uh, so here's two papers, and um, I just wanted to spend the the rest of our time. Oh, uh, oh, here it is. Sorry. Yeah, there's a worked example on our web page. I'm just going to open that up. And again, because people asked for worked examples, um, I'm going to kind of go through the code um, line by line, but you know, it is now 12.05. What do people think of um, grabbing lunch and then coming back and coding together? Um, and I'll just, I'll try really hard not to um, take, go too long until lunch, so we just have time to take a break and, and for you to talk to each other. Yeah, Connor. I don't want to keep lunch, but I have a quick question. Um, yeah. Have, have, people done, have people done sort of like explicit comparisons of the, of the results? Of no, see, all sorts of great research agendas are, so like, yeah. Say the same no, number of yeah. communities and the same oh, like, oh. K topics and oh, sort of or whatever. Yeah, not that I know of. Like, um, yeah, that would be another great paper. Right. Yeah, I mean this is a relatively new technique, uh, so I think it's pretty wide open in terms yeah. of how to. So like, what does the State of the Union look like if you do 
exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Structural top and bottom dot nine. Oh yeah, exactly. That'd be an amazing. That'd be a, a great thing. Uh, so okay, so let's get lunch and well, let's say uh, five minutes, and that way I'll talk. I'll talk for another maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then um, we'll come back together to do group exercise at one thirty.